Good evening everybody. Thank you for joining. We are proud to introduce XP Connect, a webinar series initiative by G Healthcare Ultrasound. This is a regular series uh, every fortnight featuring the best experts in the field of ultrasound. After three successful sessions, I welcome you to the fourth session. Today's session is by Dr. Balu Vaidyanathan on advanced fetal cardiac evaluation scope and applications. Dr. Balu Vaidyanathan is currently the clinical professor of pediatric cardiology and director fetal cardiac division at Amrita Institute of Medical Sciences, Kochi, Kerala. Dr. Balu has several uh, research publications, around 35 of them, and around 100 professional lectures to his credit. His primary areas of interest include fetal echocardiography, 3D, 4D echocardiography, community-based research in pediatric cardiology. This session will be for 45 minutes, followed by 10 to 15 minutes of questions and answers. You can send in your questions anytime by using the chat box underneath the video screen, and Dr. Balu will answer them post his session. So without further ado, let me welcome Dr. Vaidyanathan to begin his session. Sir, over to you. Thank you, Gaurav. It's indeed a great pleasure to join this uh, GE's uh, webinar education series. As we were discussing here before we started this uh, session, I think this is a great way of education. And I'm made to understand that a large number of people are watching this webinar. So today's topic which I'm going to discuss is regarding advanced fetal cardiac evaluation. I changed it slightly, made it easier, I made it into scope and applications. So let us start with this slide which talks about technology and how the technology is accelerating in fact at a pace which is much more rapid than how we can adapt as human beings. So this graph was taken from this uh, recent book uh, by the legendary author Thomas Friedman. This is called Thank You for Being Late. And in this we can see the, 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 the two graphs here on the side and we can see that the technology's growth is at a very very rapid phase. In fact the Gordon Moore who was the co-founder of Intel uh, made this quote long time back. The computational power of microchips will double roughly every two years. So in our parlance in medical uh, technology and in obstetric ultrasound uh, tremendous advances have been made and some of the recent advances is what we are going to discuss today. And I can sort of safely say that the equipments have got far more capabilities and we have to do a little bit of catching up in using them. So before we say that all this technology is not very useful or not very good, it is a good idea to actually try them out before we conclude that they are not useful. So this is what we are going to discuss today. So over the last 10 years or so, we all of us have listened to lectures by luminaries like Professor Rabbi Chawi and many others on this topic, 3D, 4D, fetal echo. And the question I have uh, put in front of you is, does it help? In my opinion, it really does. And these are the four ways by which I believe uh, it helps. Firstly, we can access planes which are not easily accessible by the routine 2D echocardiography particularly the plane called a Z-plane. We get a depth perception of the cardiac structures which cannot be attained by 2D. And these are particularly useful in complex intracardiac anatomy as, where the spatial relationships between the ventricles and the great arteries are important. And I actually am a pediatric cardiologist, so when I do a fetal echo and uh, and make a report. I actually report for my surgeon and see what the surgeon can actually do to correct the heart problem. So to get the surgical perspective, you need to actually have the three-dimensional uh, concept of the heart because the surgeon always operates on a heart which is three-dimensional and not two-dimensional. There is a particular utility in uh, defining extracardiac vasculature and we'll see examples of all these in this presentation. And uh, by extracardiac vasculature, I mean the aortic arches, the systemic and the pulmonary veins. And finally, one of the most useful things about 3D, 4D stick echocardiography is that it permits offline analysis. So sometimes we get new information, which I'll show in one of my case scenarios. You can um, email that, uh, uh, the data set to anybody, any expert, and you can do a remote center analysis. And these data sets are, are actually always available for an expert review later. 
So there is nothing very new about 3D uh, echocardiography or 3D. In fact, this was there from the pre-Renaissance period in, uh, in, 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 in Europe when uh, artists like Raphael uh, made these absolutely beautiful paintings, which you can see if you visit museums in uh, France or, or Italy, particularly Florence. And as we can see from this picture, on, your, on the color picture on your right hand side, you can see a group of people who are sitting in a museum or a hall. And we can see that people who are in the front have a different kind of an appearance from people who are behind. So this is actually the three, it's actually a two-dimensional painting, but made to appear like 3D because of what we call the depth perspective. Uh, I am made to understand that we had former sessions on the basics of 3D, 4D stick echocardiography. So I'm not going to spend a lot of time discussing that. But just to summarize the technique behind this, there are three aspects in 3D, 4D echocardiography. The first step is to acquire a volume data set which is typically uh, done using a reference plane. And then there are other variables like the acquisition angle, the duration of acquisition, etc. And these are the three variables. Typically, the re reference plane for the fetal heart would be the four chamber view, as you can see in the picture which I'm showing there. Once you are acquired the volume data set, the next step is to display the volume data set, data set in three planes. And these are called the A and the B and the C planes. The A and the B planes are orthogonal to each other, and you can actually see them in 2D. The C plane never exists in 2D. In fact, it is a virtual plane which is reconstructed by the computer from a volume data set. So in this display, we can see the three planes, the A plane, which is the reference plane, the four chamber view, the B plane, which is 90 degrees to that, and the C plane, which is exactly somewhere at the crux of the heart where the valves actually join. And then you can convert your pictures into a beautiful rendered images, which is what I've shown there. And this is an, in this particular case, I rendered the four chamber view by a technique called a surface rendering. And you can see uh, one of the modalities of rendering as we can see in that picture. So this is a beautiful picture of the four chamber view of the heart. And I have rendered this in two uh, different modes. On the left side of the screen, you can see the HD live mode in which you can see the four chamber view rather beautifully, in which you can see the foramen ovale flap pointing towards the left atrium. You can see the descending aortic shadow. You can see the right ventricle is beautifully identified by the chunky moderator band. The same picture is captured on the sill out mode on the other side. And here, if you look at the crux of the heart, we can see that there is a very, very nice offsetting, which we can see. The tricuspid valve is at a lower level compared to the mitral valve in this picture. So this is an example of uh, a normal four chamber view of the heart in 2D echo. And the same when it is rendered on uh, 4D uh, surface rendering. This is again an HD live with an e-stick volume. It's an electronic stick volume. You can see the depth perspective so beautifully here. The ventricular septum is, you can see it as a thick structure compared to the other one. We can see inside the heart, we can see the musculature. We can even see, if you look into the atrium, we can see a black hole behind, which is actually the opening of the inferior vena cava into the uh, right atrium. Uh, one of the things which people actually have not really tried much is the on first reconstruction of the atrioventricular valves. For us, most of the time we see the valves as this. We see the two leaflets moving up and down. But in actual surgical view, the valves are not like two-dimensional structures. They actually have multiple leaflets inside this, as we can see here. And the leaflets open and close in systole and diastole. Here I'm looking at the atrioventricular valves from the atrium, the way the surgeon will look at the, at the valves. And we can see toward on the right side near the graphic here, we can see the mitral, this is the mitral valve here. And in this side, we can see the tricuspid valve here. This is a basal view of the heart where we can see all the four valves here. This is the mitral valve, this is the aortic valve, this is the tricuspid valve, and this is the pulmonary valve. And we can see that the aortic and the mitral valves are actually close together while the tricuspid and the pulmonary are far apart. This is what we cardiologists uh, define as aortomitral discontinuity. And here the aorta is to the right and posterior of the uh, pulmonary artery, which is a normal uh, relationship of the, uh, the PA is left and anterior. In situations like transposition, these relationships can get altered. This is the ventricular septum, which is rendered on 4D. 
and this is another picture which is a short axis view of the ventricular septum we can see it beautifully here this is the left ventricle and this is the right ventricle you can see the tricuspid valve leaflets in contact with the ventricular septum and these are rendered images using hd live mostly with the electronic probe so you get absolutely brilliant clarity of the endocardial surface of the valve you can see the endocardial surface beautifully in this picture the other thing which we do is to see the surgical perspective for the ventricular septum. As we can see here, this is a ventricular septum which we can actually see in this uh, on the uh, pathological specimen of the ventricular septum which we can see on this side. And the other is an actual cardiac specimen of, of uh, rendered using the 4D. And here what I have done is I have shown the ventricular septum on FAS uh, from the right ventricular side. There are different parts of the ventricular septum. This is the inlet portion which you can see here. This is a muscular portion which you can see over there, the apical muscular portion. This is a mid muscular portion. This is what we call the perimembranous portion. And just above that you can see the iota going off, uh, just above that. And then we can see the outlet portion here. So the actual ventricular septum looks like this not like the line which you are familiar with. This is the way the surgeon sees and with the new technology which we have, we can actually visualize the ventricular septum exactly the way the surgeon would see. And imagine doing that in a fetus which is about just about 22 weeks. Here I have shown the 4D rendering picture of the left ventricular outflow tract here. We can see the iota, this is a septo iotal continuity, we can see here which is typically lost in tetralogy of fallow and here sorry we can we can also see the iota mitral continuity just below that just below that the aortic valve and the mitral valve are continuous with each other this is a septo aortic continuity the next picture which we all like to see is the outflow tracts which cross each other this is a classical uh, crisscross arrangement captured with hd live color rendering and this is very nicely seen on the glass body mode on hd live we can see that the outflow tracks cross each other beautifully and uh, this is a very very important concept in fetal cardiology to get the pictures of the aortic arch this is not really a bad picture on tube b and with on color you can see the aortic valve on cross section and sometimes you can see coronary arteries also but it's quite a different feel to see the aortic arch on like this on 4D with the branches coming off and this is just quite a stunning picture of the aortic arch with HD co live color rendering. You can actually see so beautifully the aortic arch and, uh, and in, on this side of this picture we can see the branches of the aortic arch coming off here, the small little branches and you can see the entire descending aorta so beautifully here. This is the inferior vena cava which is joining the right atrium. Here we see the pulmonary veins which are joining the left atrium. If you are wondering what this particular structure is, this is the left lower pulmonary vein joining the left atrium over here. The ductal arch, which is the three vessel tracheal view, the V-shaped structure, we can see this uh, very nicely, the, the, the picture over here, the ductal arch, which is indifferent to the aortic arch. This is shaped like a hockey stick, while the aortic arch in the previous pictures looks like an umbrella handle or the cane handle. And then you can, of course, uh, look at the venous system of the heart, this is the familiar hammock view which we know. We can see both the veins over there. And you can actually see the hepatoportal system with spectacular clarity. Uh, we can see all the different little, little veins joining the hepatoportal system. And a lot of study needs to be done in this in pathological uh, specimens. Uh, and finally, the last component of the normal anatomy which I would like to show to you is the pulmonary veins. Imagine this picture of the left atrium. Sometimes we struggle to see even one or two pulmonary veins, but here we can see one, two, three, and all four of them draining the left atrium. In this picture, what I have done is I have rotated this same picture posteriorly. So you are visualizing the LA from behind, and you can see the LA here, and all the four pulmonary veins, as I have shown here, are joining the left atrium. So it's quite an incredible amount of technology to see all the four pulmonary veins in a 20, 24 week fetus. And here we can even see the small vinular branches also. Right, so we have seen quite uh, a number of interesting examples of normal heart, but is it just for normal hearts? I mean, we can always impress people by showing these lovely pictures and you know, uh, say you're doing something, but it's quite a different level of skill and understanding to interpret pictures of an abnormal heart. And for me, nothing is more difficult than the double outlet right ventricle. 
And for that, it's not just two uh, outflows coming from the RV. There's quite a lot of things which we need to understand about the double outlet right ventricle. And some of the important points which the surgeons will ask us is what I have shown here. The location of the ventricular septal defect, the rootability of the VSD to the outflow. That is whether you can connect the left ventricle to the iota or PA. That's a very important question. The relationship of outflow tracks to the VSD and the relationship of outflow tracks to each other. So these are the four questions which the surgeon asked me when he, I present to him a case of DORV for surgical repair. I will probably skip this slide because it's very complicated in the sense that DORV, there are 16 different types of DORV based on, on one side, the great artery relationship, and on the other side, the location of the ventricular septal defect. By and large, the most common type of DORV is where you have a sub-iotic VSD with side-by-side -side great arteries. As we can see here, 46% of DORVs fall into that category. And for the great artery relationship in DORV also, you can have various combinations. You can have side-by-side -side as what we see in the center. You can have an anterior iota as we see on the right side. Uh, anterior iota which is right or left, directly anteroposterior. So it's just a very complex situation. So there was one study which is published from UK regarding the role of incremental role of three-dimensional fetal echocardiography for predicting the postnatal surgical approach in DORV. This was pioneered by a very close a friend and associate of mine, uh, Dr. John Simpson, working in Evelina Children's Hospital. And in this study, they have included six patients, and they've shown that they could absolutely and accurately predict what surgery will be performed for this patient with DORV using three-dimensional fetal echocardiography. And this was published in Ultrasound and Obstetrics and Gynecology in 2013. Let me show you one such example where I found uh, that this was particularly useful. This was a primary at, uh, referred at uh, 24 weeks. The four-chamber view was normal. And at the outflow level, we could see very clearly that this is the RV. We could see that the, both the great arteries were arising from the right ventricle. And on the color flow, we could see that there is a VSD. So here we can see that th there is a VSD. Both the outflows are from the RV. And the anterior one, this one, appeared to be the iota. So many people would have happily made the diagnosis of a transposition like DORV. And here we can see that both the outflows are very clearly from the uh, RV. And uh, the, perhaps we can say that the pulmonary artery appeared a little narrow here. So the iotic arch looked OK. There was no obvious obstruction. The three-vessel tracheal view looked OK. At that level, there was no narrowing of the iota. There was a left arch, which was V-shaped. The next thing which we can do is what we call TUI, or tomographic ultrasound imaging, in which we can see all these pictures together in one screen. Here we can see the VSD. Here we can see the iota coming from the RV. Here we can see both the outflows coming from the RV. And here we can see up to the level of the arch, the V-shaped arch. Now what I then did was I turned on my uh, 4D uh, knob on and started rendering. VSD is beautifully seen here. And the next picture, we could see both the outflows arising from the RV very nicely. And then moved on to the uh, picture of the iotic arch. This is a branch which is coming off here. The PA appeared a little narrow here, but the iota was absolutely good sized. And then this is a really good picture which we got. Uh, this is a picture which is HD live rendering. This is a left ventricle. This is a right ventricle. And let us see this picture. This is a still out rendering of the same. We could see the LV, the RV, this is a VSD, this is the IOTA, this is a PA which is bifurcating. You can see this is what we call the coronal septum. In DORV, we have bilateral coronal septum, one here, one here. And this is a really beautiful picture of a DORV, which is a transposition like DORV, perhaps with a little bit of narrowing of the pulmonary outflow between the two coronal septa. So it's a DORV which is TGA type, no coarctation. So what can we do for this? So I speculated that the surgeon can, what the surgeon can do is, the surgeon can switch these great arteries like this. So the PA is brought completely towards the right ventricular side. The iota is brought towards the left ventricular side. And then he closes the VSD in such a way that the LV is rooted towards the iota. So thus, 
it is possible to do a complete repair, which is an arterial switch operation, single stage anatomical correction, and this uh, baby is expected to have an excellent long-term outcome. So at 24 weeks pregnancy, I, we were able to predict what surgery could be done for this baby, and this is exactly what was happened. This baby was delivered in our center, was stable on, on the eighth day of life. The surgeon did this operation. The baby has been shifted to the ward and is doing really well and, and waiting for discharge. We have 110 cases of DORE, and of which we have the outcomes in uh, 47 of them were delivered in, in our center. And uh, what we actually found out that the overall diagnostic accuracy with the 2D was about 74%, while with 3D, 4D stick, it increased to 100%. And we could predict a single stage bioventricular repair with 2D in about 60% cases, while with 3D, 4D, it was absolutely 100% spot on. So this is a further reinforcement of Simpson's paper uh, suggesting that 3D, 4D echocardiography is definitely helpful in DORD. Now let us see another case scenario. So this is a complex heart. Obviously we can see here that this ventricle is small. There is only one large ventricle here. There's a single valve. There was a lot of problems with the situs in this patient. There was a dextrocardia with situs solitus in this case. And this is the HD live picture, the same thing which we saw. And this was the normal valve is seen on here, but here in this case there was only one atrioventricular valve. It was an example of a common atrioventricular valve or an AV septal defect. So in this case it was an unbalanced AV septal defect favoring the right ventricle, single ventricle. The outflow tracks were also abnormal. We could see the iota is on top here, the PA is the smaller vessel here which is quite narrow here. So there was a transposed outflow tracts with severe pulmonic stenosis here. And the aortic arch was normal, as we can see here. There's nothing wrong. But we did the post-processing, and there was something which is not uh, missing here. We got everything. We got cytosolitis. We got dextrocardia. We got unbalanced AV septal defect. We got single ventricle. We got transposed outflow tracts. We got pulmonic stenosis. We got a normal aortic arch. What else can this fetus have? And when we looked at these pictures, there is, I could see something here, running here, parallel to the iota running here. And this sort of uh, captured my attention, and this was much, much later. This is a post-processing which I was doing offline at home because something about this heart was bothering me. And when eventually, finally, I could actually render this offline using 4D view on my laptop, and I could see in this case that there was a anomalous pulmonary vein drainage. This is a track going to the portal vein. So in addition to everything which we saw, there was an additional element as well. That's an infracardiac TAPVC. So this is an infracardiac TAPVC to the portal vein. So it's a really complex anomaly. And the implication of finding that infracardiac TAPVC was that if this baby is likely to present in a very critical circulation, and hence the baby had to be delivered, in a cardiac center. Obviously, this is a family which wanted to proceed with surgery, and this additional diagnosis helped us to deliver the baby in the cardiac center and go for surgery without delay. So that was life-saving in this case. This is another beautiful example of a 32-week primary, which is referred to me because of asymmetry of the ventricles. And here, as we can see in this picture, this is a left ventricle, which appears a little smaller, but it is forming the apex of the heart nonetheless. The right ventricle appears chunky. Some people may say, okay, this is perhaps okay for a third trimester. But I continued, and I could see that the mitral valve was a little smaller compared to the tricuspid. The Z scores of the mitral valve was minus 1.5, while the tricuspid valve was 1.4. And the color flow mapping uh, showed that there is a good anti-grade flow. And here we can see in this picture there is perhaps a suggestion of a dilated coronary sinus suggesting a left SVC, which is eventually confirmed in the uh, three-vessel view. We could see four-vessel, which is a persistent left SVC. So we could see persistent left SVC with a mild ventricular disproportion. And this was a very critical picture. When we saw, saw the three-vessel view and measured the size of the iota and took the reference values, the iota was smaller for the gestational age. The, the, the Z-scores the Z scores for the iota was minus 1.7, which suggests that the iota is small. 
So we proceeded to the three-vessel tracheal view, and here clearly we can see that there is a narrowing on the aortic side of the three-vessel tracheal view. The isthmus looks small, the duct isthmus ratio is 0 0.5, and the isthmus Z-score is minus 2.2, which is suggesting that it is really small. And in this three-vessel tracheal view, we can very, very clearly see that the aortic side of the uh, three-vessel tracheal view is smaller. And here we could see the shelf eventually, and that is clearly a suggestion of coarctation of iota. We could see that beautifully here, there where I have measured the narrow segment. How does it look on uh, 3D, 4D? So this is how it looks. We can see this very beautifully here. We can see the, uh, the aortic arch coming here, and if you notice this particular point here, it is narrow here. And here is a picture which shows it even better. The branches of the aortic arch are seen here, and as we can see here, at this point, the aortic arch is narrow. What is incredibly interesting is the fact that you can see behind the aortic arch, the ductal arch, which is always present in a fetus. So this baby has got critical coarctation of aorta here, but the fetal circulation is not affected because the ductal arch is wide open and blood can go into the descending aorta through both the arches in the fetal life. I will show you the graphics of what happens when the baby is born and goes through the transitional circulation. So coarctation, this is the same picture which I have rendered on HD Live, and we can see how narrow the aortic arch is. We can see the branches coming off from this very, very small aortic arch. The same picture of coarctation here. We can see the narrow segment, and again, beautifully, the same narrow segment in various forms of rendering. So this is the bottleneck, which is the aortic arch. But the fetus is protected by the fact that there's a much bigger ductal arch behind it, which maintains the circulation in utero. But I will explain to you very shortly what happens after birth. So let us see this graphic. So what happens during transition? So this is the coarctation, the shelf which we can see here. The ductus is open. So after birth, what happens is the duct will start to close. That's the way it behaves. The ductus arterioles will constrict after birth, and now the coarctation is manifesting. This typically happens on the second or third day of life. And by the time the baby becomes about a week old, we expect the ductus arterioles to close completely. And that's the time the coarctation becomes completely and totally, totally manifest. And if you miss this, the baby is going to die. There is no other alternative because there is no blood flow whatsoever going towards the lower limbs. And the baby will die because of cardiogenic, cardiogenic shock. So before anybody realizes a baby who was well at birth, the picture number one, suddenly transits through these three stages and ends up in a state of cardiogenic shock from which unless somebody immediately acts upon the situation, there is no hope for survival. So I saw this patient who was, uh, again, a very similar picture from what we saw before, but here there is something much more. So this is the outflow of use of, the, of a 28-week of a fetus referred as coarctation. And here, this is the pulmonary artery, this is the iota, and we can see a very large gap here between the iota and the PA. And that is rendered on surface rendering here. And see this picture? This is the iota, this is the pulmonary outflow, this is the pulmonary valve, this is the right pulmonary artery, this is the left pulmonary artery, and we could see a very massive defect here, right here. And this is an example of an iotopulmonary window. It did not end with that in this case. And when we interrogated the iotic arch in this patient, we could see that this arch was completely interrupted. There is no continuity of the iotic arch. The iotic arch is completely interrupted. We can see the AA is ascending iota, IA is the nominate artery, D is a ductus arteriosus, which is continuing into the descending aorta. The ascending aorta and the descending aorta are completely disconnected. And then with this picture, we could actually clearly see every single aspect of this anatomy. And this is why I said it's an absolutely spectacular tool for the evaluation of the aortic arch. We can see the ascending aorta, which is marked as AA, and then the aorta completely stops it's totally interrupted. We can see the branches of the iota coming off, the left common carotid, LCCA, and left subclavian, LSCA. So after the left subclavian, the iota is interrupted. The descending iota is marked as DA here, and that is supplied purely through the ductus arteriosus, which is from the pulmonary artery. So this is the fetal circulation. So after birth, when the ductus arteriosus closes, 
the descending aorta has absolutely no source of blood flow and so this baby will die. So what happened for this baby was the baby was delivered in a center which is 8 hours from the our center. The neonatologist called and we started prostaglandin, they transported the baby. What happened was the mother was planned for a delivery in the cardiac facility but developed sudden leaking. So they initiated prostaglandin to keep the ductus open, transported the baby safely. Baby was operated on fourth day of life and is ready to celebrate his first birthday uh, in the next few months. So it's a spectacular outcome for this baby. And we published this in circulation re this year in May. This was a case report which we published because this was the first such report of a 4D stick rendering in aortic arch interruption in literature. So this slide we have seen already. So the implications is that duct-dependent coarctation or interruption is something which is very often missed clinically. And it needs an emergency surgery and very, very important to start treatment urgently after birth. Planned delivery is recommended. So prenatal diagnosis is absolutely life-saving in this condition. And the other situation where prenatal diagnosis can be absolutely beautifully life-saving is transposition of great arteries. Now we see the last case scenario here, which is a 28-year-old uh, primary referred because of suspected outflow anomaly. Here we can very clearly see that in the 2D that there is a uh, VSD with an overriding iota which I have rendered here. We can see the iota which is very big and there's a VSD which is overriding. And when it comes to the, uh, the right ventricular outflow, we could see the, the, con the two pulmonary arteries are seen here. And in the next picture, the middle picture, you can see a reverse flow into the ductus arteriosus. And this was a case of uh, tetralogy of fallow with pulmonary atresia. And we can see in this last picture, which is a, a VCI mode rendering, we could see the iota AO, which is big, and the very small D, that's a red flow into that, that's a reverse flow into the ductus arteriosus, which is different from the normal ductus arteriosus. In this case, you don't get the usual type of duct, but it's a rather tortuous vertical duct, which inserts into the branch pulmonary arteries, as we can see in this picture. And this is actually the pathology correlate, and we can actually get a perfect picture of this rendering with sill out rendering here. We could see the ascending aorta marked AA, the descending aorta, which is DA. The ductus arteriosus is marked as D, the vertical duct. And you can see that actually going and inserting and connecting to both the pulmonary arteries. The R and the L are the right and the left pulmonary arteries, respectively. And this is showing the reverse flow. So this is an example of pulmonary atresia. And what happens is that in utero, the ductus arteriosus is open, but after birth, it will close. So suddenly, the baby will develop critical cyanosis, and unless we start treatment, the baby will die. And what should be done is that prostaglandin has to be started to keep the ductus open. And then, typically, we put a procedure called the ductal stending. We stend this arterial duct. So when we have this kind of images in utero, it is very clear that what the baby needs after birth. So everything can be planned while the baby is still residing inside the mother's womb and the postnatal care can be just coordinated with cardiology team beautifully without delay and procedures can be done in, in, in the, in, without any delay in a very good uh, clinical condition of the uh, baby. Now I am moving on to the final aspect of uh, this lecture. So all this time we were talking about, uh, we were talking about how the 3D, 4D enables a much better and a much detailed assessment of the uh, cardiac anatomy. So we saw uh, four examples uh, of uh, abnormal hearts. We saw double outlet right ventricle. We saw a heterotaxy, that's a right isomerism in which there was a TAPVC. We saw a case of coarctation of iota and the bigger brother of coarctation, which is the arch interruption. And we also saw a case of pulmonary atresia where we could actually image the anatomy of the vertical duct and tell the pediatric cardiologist that, okay, after the birth, you can go ahead and do the ductal stending for this baby. Is it all? Absolutely no. We can do much more with this uh, 3D, 4D stick. And this is something which uh, even uh, we are learning, and I cannot claim uh, incredible expertise in this. But as is the case with the postnatal circulation, postnatal echo, we can actually do assessment of the intracardiac volumes in utero. This can be very, very difficult because the volumes are very small in the fetus. This situation comes when we have a doubt about, okay, a particular left ventricular volume is adequate or not. 
somebody who does in utero interventions like an aortic stenosis sometimes will ask this question is this LV good enough should I do this uh, in utero intervention or just leave it and ask the surgeon to do the uh, operation for the hypoplastic left heart after the baby is born so these things are important so what happens after intervention and this is particularly true for aortic stenosis the other situation where the intracardiac volumes may be evaluated is Epstein's anomaly of the tricuspid valve, which I will show a slide of how it can be helpful in prognostication. And eventually, what we will be doing is we will be doing cardiac output measurements, and in fact, not just a broad cardiac output, but rather how much cardiac output goes to individual parts of the fetal body. And now people are using functional MRI in the fetus to study the, the blood flow to the brain in various forms of congenital heart defects and seeing which type of congenital heart defects the brain can be affected more than certain other types. And these are all exciting areas which, uh, in which research only is happening and in future uh, more applications will come in. So this is one such slide which in which <clears throat> I'm actually, this particular uh, uh, picture is actually showing the assessment of the ventricular and the atrial volumes. So all the four volumes, this is an ele electronic stick uh, volume data. What you need is the edges of the chambers has to be very clearly defined, otherwise you won't get this. So I did this on the four chamber view and I got similar pictures on the other planes and on the uh, 4D, uh, that, that on, the, on, the, on the stick picture as well. So we could see all the four chambers and we can measure these volumes and these are useful in certain situations which I'll come to. This is the same volume which in which I use an offline stick here. I did an offline stick here and I could see the uh, the, 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 ventric the, the, the ventricles here, the, the M mode of the ventricles here, and this is like, this is a left ventricle and this is a right ventricle. And we can see this is a ventricular septum in the middle. The corresponding picture, this is a ventricular septum, so we see the corresponding ventricular septum here. This is the free wall of the right ventricle. It's a bit dark here, but it can see, still see the free wall of the right ventricle here. And here is a free wall of the left ventricle, and we can see this nicely moving. So these movements here in between are the systole and in between the, you see the diastole. So in, with this you can actually measure the ejection fraction of the left ventricle uh, very nicely. And the next picture I'm showing various methods to assess a function using the stick M mode. So this, the first picture is showing the assessment of the tricuspid valve excursion, what we call TAPC. Very useful uh, method to assess a right ventricular function. All you need is a volume data set and put the stick M line, uh, stick M mode line on the tricuspid valve lateral annulus and you can see the excursion here and you can measure the excursion beautifully. This is an atrioventricular uh, M mode and this is particularly useful in arrhythmias. Uh, like you want to see the relationship between the atria and the ventricles. On top you have the atria and bottom we have the ventricle and in this case it's one to one conduction. And finally, as I showed in the previous picture, you can put M mode over the two ventricles also, and that will be useful to determine the ventricular function by methods like uh, ejection fraction or fra fractional shortening. All you need is to take a good volume of the heart in the four chamber view, and you can actually you know, display it whichever way you want, put the M mode cursors and get a lot of information offline. And in fact, sometimes this is in fact even better than an online assessment because the, you can put the line whichever way you want. You can draw the line whichever way, way you want. Ideally, if you had a real volume, we could have shown how this is done, but perhaps some of these things should be kept for a future assessment. We can't give everything away in one lecture, right? So this is uh, an example of a case with aortic stenosis in which we did a balloon aortic valvotomy. Here we can see this is a left ventricle here. This is the right ventricle here. The heart is surrounded by fluid suggesting pericardial effusion. And here we can see the left ventricle here. And this is the right ventricle here. As we can see that this ventricle is not at all contracting. And I can actually measure the LV volumes here. This is, uh, we can measure. There are standard nomograms which are being developed. To what is normal or what is abnormal. And in this, this particular case, the LV does look pretty good. Sometimes the left ventricle may be very small and then an in utero intervention may not be attempted. But in this particular case, the LV size looks very, very good. So here, what I'm actually showing is in pre-procedure here, this is the left ventricle here, and this is the left atrium. What was happening is that the LV was so dysfunctional 
that there was no blood going from the left atrium towards the LV. Everything was going across the atrial septum into the right side. So the blood was getting completely taken away from the LV at all and nothing going to the iota. And what happened after the intervention? We opened up the aortic valve in utero and this was what happened. And on the second day after the procedure, we could see a hell of a lot of difference. You could see this is a left atrium, a lot of filling of the LV here. And, uh, and of course, uh, that is a really an encouraging sign. This baby actually continued to survive till term and had a successful delivery. Unfortunately, required a major surgical procedure which the family declined and hence we did not have a good postnatal outcome, which is what we would have ideally wanted. But prenatally, the procedure had a very good technical success. So I had told you that I will discuss the role of uh, the volumetric analysis in another setting of that. This is a setting of Epstein's anomaly. So we have a very large right atrium here. We have the tricuspid valve, which is quite uh, inserting much below here. A relatively small right ventricle. We can see a, this is a left ventricle and the left atrium here. And this is the same picture which we have rendered on surface mode. You can see the massive right atrium. There's a foramen oval, you can wide open the tricuspid valve, which is at a much lower level. And in this case, uh, there is a useful score, which is called a GO score, G-O-S-C score. This stand, stands for Great Ormond Street uh, score for Epstein's. G-O-S-C, Great Ormond Street for Epstein score. And this is very useful for prognostication. You need a picture which is showing the edges of the heart and the chambers like what we can see here. This is an ele electronic stick. Uh, uh, volume which is being rendered. So what we need to do is we need to measure this first. So we have the right atrium and the atrialized right uh, ventricle here. That is what we are showing here. This is the largest chamber. This is a true right ventricle which is quite small. And this is the entire left atrium and the left ventricle together. So in the GOSC score, it is the, the it's calculated this way. Right atrium plus atrialized right ventricle. That's the numerator. And on denominator, you put the right ventricle and the left atrium and the left ventricle. So this essentially tells you that if the right atrial enlargement becomes more and more and more, the numerator of this uh, ratio becomes more. And that is a sign of a poor prognosis. So in this particular study, which is published from England, they suggested that if the score is more than one, which means that the RA and the atrialized RV is more than the other three chambers put together, that's bad. And if it's 1.5, it's pretty bad, very, very bad. And it can even suggest to you that, right, the baby can, in fact, the fetus can die in utero. It's more than 1.5. In this case, it was 1.31. And that obviously was suggesting that this is not a great Epstein's and it's likely to have a very stormy newborn period. Now, this is something which I have not used much. And this is, I'm leaving with you with this because this is an automatic software. And now uh, there's a lot of uh, interest in uh, several parts of the world on the use of uh, automatic systems and artificial intelligence. And in fetal heart, uh, this is uh, one such attempt. We knew about the sonar VCAT, but what is being told to me is that instead of the much more complex methods and uh, where we used to have, we had to superimpose the entire heart on those VCAT images. Now we can do it in a much more simple way. The first step is to click on the apex and the crux and to get a line like this. And then the second is to click on the iota. Then you tell, just like we say, um, uh, um, Alexa, uh, what is the capital of Australia? Just like that, you say, Sono Vika, show me the chambers of the heart. And uh, you confirm the alignments here, and then it will start showing you the other things. This is the Sono Vika, just like Alexa does everything for us. This Sono Vika is claimed to do everything for the rest of the, of the views of the fetal heart. So, this is all whatever you want to see. Like here, you can choose what all you want. You want the four chamber, you want SPC, IVC. Choose all these things, and uh, you can actually get those pictures like what is shown here. It's something like a TUI. So, from a single uh, single uh, four chamber view and two reference points, that's a crooks to the apex, the one line and the descending at and the other. The software does pretty much the rest of things uh, for you. So obviously in the normal heart, I suspect it's going to work out well. And I'll be very, very interested to test this in abnormal hearts because in abnormal hearts, obviously we are dealing with uh, obviously different relationships of the heart, the ventricles to the outflows, and we will have to see how much this helps. But at least if it can tell the 
operator that, okay, there are, there's something not right about his heart, I will accept this uh, software. So let me just summarize what we learned today. And this uh, summary slide will be relayed to the participants uh, by the organizers uh, shortly. The first thing is that before we say that the technology is uh, nonsense, I would uh, argue for, and I would rather urge you to use it and try it out and see how it can be helpful. And let me be very honest with you, ever since I started using 3D, 4D stick echocardiography, particularly in fetuses with abnormal hearts, I have found this technology extremely useful. And for me, it will give incremental information about intracardiac anatomy and spatial relationships. And this is a situation, DORV. Uh, I mean, it's really incredibly useful and it helps in planning, the surgical plan and counseling. It does provide incremental information on difficult extracardiac vascular anatomy, particularly venous connections. We saw a case of TAPVC, which was actually diagnosed offline much after the patient had left the examining room because the operator was not totally satisfied with what we diagnosed. It was felt something was missing. For arch anatomy, like coarctation and interruption of the aortica, there is nothing like this. It just gives you spectacular pictures with such clarity that all you need to do is to actually plan how to fix the problem after the baby is born. I think in future the functional assessment so the fetal heart is going to come in a very big way and I'm, it's going to be the focus of my interest in 2019 when we announce fetal heart in 2019 it is going to be a session on fetal cardiac function exclusively and with uh, hopefully John Simpson and uh, a lot of intracardiac volumetric analysis. These are all the things which are really, really very exciting and very, very interesting. And finally, I think this we have been doing this uh, in several places. When we have these volumes, it not just permits the offline analysis for the operator, but it also helps transfer data, expert review, and uh, I mean, I have not shown this, put this, but it helps teaching. Now, we don't need a patient, really. If you have the volume data set of the heart, you can just carry it in your laptop, go anywhere and teach any people. You can actually sit in the beach and uh, teach a number of people who are interested and in how to uh, do the, do the you know, rendering, etc. anywhere. All you need is a computer and an interested group of people to learn. So I really feel that uh, this is a technology which has actually transformed um, prenatal diagnosis and made the prenatal diagnosis as accurate as the diagnosis after birth. I will leave you with this slide. Uh, because sometimes when people see pictures uh, and uh, they think it's uh, quite easy and uh, anybody can do it. But one of the things which is very, very important is that before we endeavor and embark on this journey, it is extremely important that we study the anatomy very well. The, as a learner should begin with learning the normal cardiac anatomy. Nothing comes easy. It, you have to put in a lot of effort in understanding the normal cardiac anatomy. And that is what in this is said about Michelangelo's creation of Adam. Adam, the very famous painting which you will find in uh, by the Italian uh, maestro. It is said only after the intellect has planned the best and the highest can the ready hand take up the brush and try all things considered. Which means that the brain is the most important aspect of this entire exercise. You need to internalize these pictures inside your brain. Imagine this and then actually use the technology to make it happen. Thank you so much for listening to me. And if you have further queries, you are always welcome to visit us and visit our program. And uh, you know, and we do a large number of cases of fetal heart with 3D, 4D stick. And um, so you can learn from this uh, with us. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Balu, for such a wonderful session. So we will now move to the questions and answers series. Uh, we have received plenty of questions. Dr. Balu will uh, try to answer as much as possible. Absolutely. That's the... Uh, yes, so let's have some of these uh, questions. Okay, so I'm going to read some of these questions which has come to us. The first question is, uh, which view can we see the outlet portion of the interventricular septum? Which view to appreciate the outlet type of VSD? So that's a really good question, okay? It's a really good question because the outlet portion of the VSD is something which uh, is quite difficult. Uh, the best view for the outlet portion of the septum is 
the view when you actually see the pulmonary artery arising from the right ventricle that's the rvot view you can see this in a stick you can actually see the lvot first and then with the wire rotation you can see the rvot where the pulmonary artery comes from the right ventricle and there you can see the ventricular septum and that is the portion the below the pulmonary valve that is the outlet portion of the right ventricle so you can actually do it in in 2d with the rvot sweep and when you see the pulmonary artery coming off from the rv see the septum just below the valve and that is the outflow septum what is the next question uh, how do we diagnose asd and vsd okay and uh, asd of course i am not uh, i don't think it's a very big deal to diagnose asds in utero i really do not think that question has much relevance uh, for the discussion there are three types of asds one is a usual fossa ovalis asds where you actually have the uh, the it's a foramen ovale area itself so obviously you cannot diagnose that in utero because there is a normal foramen ovale the asd which you should endeavor to diagnose in utero is the primum type of asd the primum type of asd occurs as a part of the av septal defect complex sometimes you may find only the primum asd sometimes it will be associated with an inlet vsd also so if you have an asd with an inlet vsd primum asd and inlet vsd that we call a complete av septal defect a primum asd alone is refers is 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 described as a partial av septal defect this is something which we can easily diagnose by the four chamber view alone all you need is to look at the crux of the heart and then you can make out the primum asd but i don't think you it's uh, very important or can you cannot diagnose a secondum asd easily uh, in in fetus the third type of asd is called a sinus venous asd it's a very dangerous uh, diagnosis in utero because you can be more likely to be wrong than right and perhaps it's not so relevant to make the diagnosis of such conditions in utero right the next question is uh, what are the anomalies associated with pericardial uh, effusion okay pericardial effusion is nothing but uh, maybe a sign of high drops fetalis uh the fluid collection if there is associated with pleural and ascites that's we call high drops most of the congenital heart defects are well tolerated in utero they don't cause effusions the conditions where you can have uh, high drops are one valve or regurgitations typically you have, if you have epstein's anomaly of the tricuspid valve that in such situation the heart can fail and can have effusion uh rhythm problems that is tachycardias and bradycardias uh, if the heart fails you can have develop pericardial effusion another condition where you can actually get is if there is an in utero constriction of the ductus arteriosus or the foramen ovale that will increase the right atrial pressure and cause pericardial effusion so any condition where the fetal cardiac output is compromised leading to heart failure can have pericardial effusion now the other very important thing for you to take home is that sometimes you will find in normal fetuses a small rim of pericardial effusion particularly around the right ventricle i don't like to say a particular number to say what is normal and below what is abnormal in books it says to up to 2 mm 2.5 mm effusions may be considered to be normal so sometimes this is just a lubricating fluid around the heart right frequency of cardiac anomalies uh, right frequency in postnatal series is about 6 to 8 per thousand live births and for critical and major heart defects is about 2 to 3 per thousand live births So in India, with 25 million births happening every year, you can count how many will be born with heart defects in India every year. In Kerala, with 5 lakh births every year, we uh, about 4,000 children are born with heart defects. In India, at least 100,000 will be born every year with critical heart disease. LVOT, RVOT views to be included in routine 20, 18 to 22 week anomaly scan. Oh yeah, I mean, or just the four chamber view. I think obviously there is no question. Uh, any fetal cardiac evaluation nowadays even the basic ones should have the four chamber view the outflow tracks and i would also add the three vessel view you have to do these three views which is absolutely mandatory if you do only the four chamber view you are likely to end missing a lot of critical problems some of the things which we discussed like coarctation of aorta a simple three vessel view will help you to pick it up or suspect it in coarctation the clue for you will be the fact that the aorta will be smaller that the pa and the size of the aorta will be small compared to the expected size for the gestational age so the three vessel view can be uh, definitely definitely uh, will be very very 
uh, useful. So I would say that you should do all the three views. Now I have a very nice question. What is the Z score of the isthmus? Purpose of it? Yeah, that's a good question. The Z score of the isthmus. Z score is basically, it's not just isthmus, it's for anything. Z score means it is calculated this way. The, ex the, the, the obtained value minus the expected value for the gestational age divided by standard deviation. Now in the newer generation of the ultrasound machines uh, which we use, the Z scores are actually in, incorporated into the machine. So if you enter the gestational age and then uh, measure any, any, any uh, parameter, let us say, let it be iota or pulmonary artery or the isthmus, then uh, you can get the Z score. Now Z score, the normal range which is within the 95% confidence limits is minus 2 to plus 2. So plus 2 means it's bigger, minus is smaller. So within minus 2 to plus 2 comes within the 95% confidence limits. Which means that, I'll give you a different example. Uh, for an Indian, average Indian male, if you say that the height range is from 5 feet to 6 feet, that is within the normal range. Which means 5 feet is the smaller uh, uh, extreme of normal, minus 2 and 6 is the upper extreme, plus 2. So beyond 6 foot, if somebody is 7 feet tall, then obviously he is uh, quite tall, abnormally tall. And somebody is less than 5 feet, 4 feet tall, that means he's short, very short. It's just like that. So for the isthmus, it is again the same. For isthmus, if it is said that if you get an isthmus Z score of less than minus 2, that means the diotic isthmus is small, and that is a kind of a baby who is likely to have coarctation uh, of iota after birth. So that is why the isthmus set score is a very very useful tool. And this may be measured in, uh, ideally we can measure it in two views, either the three vessel tracheal view where the two arches meet or we can measure it in the sagittal view of the aortic arch. Isthmus has to be measured after the origin of the left subclavian artery. Okay, I think I have answered that question already. The outlet portion and the frequency of cardiac anomalies, I think I have answered. So, Thank you everyone for participating in session 4 of the XP Connect webinar series. I would like to thank Dr. Balu Vadyanathan again for making the session very informative. I'm sure our viewers have much benefited from your expertise from a clinical experience. Our next webinar, the session 5, will be on 26th July. The topic is evaluation of fetal thorax and the speaker will be Dr. Bijoy. We'll soon share the email to register. Stay tuned, good night and goodbye. Thank you, sir. Thank you, Gaurav.